Hello and welcome back, friends, to... I can call you guys friends, right? I mean, if you've gotten this far, we've spent hours together. We're practically family. Nick Sal here, in case you have, you're just joining us here at the tail end of Stephen King. I'm Nick. Hi. You should go back, watch the dozen, 20, 30 videos we made leading up to this. But we are screaming in towards the end of Stephen King's The Eyes of the Dragon. I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. Let's get right into chapter 106. It's Flag, Dennis's sleep-fuddled mind thought, as that dark shape with the burning eyes swept down on him. Remember where we last left off, Dennis has passed out on the napkins, having completed some missions and some stuff he was working on, and he wakes up and sees some burning eyes looking down on him, thinks it's Flag. Uh, it's Flag. He's found me, and now he'll rip my throat out with his teeth. He tried to scream, but no sound came out. The sound of the intruder did open. The mouth, the, the sound, the mouth of the intruder did open. Dennis saw huge white teeth, and then a big warm tongue was lapping his face. Oof, Dennis said, trying to push the thing away. Paws came up on either shoulder, and Dennis fell back on his mattress of napkins like a pinned wrestler. Lap, lap, lick, lick. Oof, Dennis said again and the dark, shaggy shape uttered a low, companionable woof, as if to say, I know it, I'm glad to see you too. Frisky, a low voice called from the darkness. Stand down, Frisky, no sounds. The dark shape was not flag at all. It was an extremely large dog, a dog which looked too much like a wolf for comfort, Dennis thought. When the girl spoke, it drew away and sat down. It looked happily at Dennis, its tail thumped mutedly on Dennis's bed of napkins. Two more shapes in the darkness, one taller than the other. Not flag, that much was clear. Castle guards, then. Dennis grabbed his dagger. If the gods... Remember, because he's never met Frisky or anything like that. If the gods were good, he might be able to get rid of both of them. If not, then he would try to die well in service of the king. The two figures had stopped a little short of him. Come on, Dennis said and raised his dagger. It was really not much more than a pocket knife and was rather rusty and quite dull, in a brave gesture. First you two, and then your devil dog. Dennis? The voice was eerily familiar. Dennis, have we really found you? Dennis started to lower his dagger, then brought it up again. It had to be a trick. Had to be. But the voice sounded so much like... Ben? He whispered. Is it Ben Stodd? It's Ben, a tall, the taller shape confirmed, and gladness filled Dennis's heart. The shape began to come forward. Alarmed, Dennis raised his dagger again. Wait, do you have a light? Flint and steel, yes. Strike it. Aye. A moment later, a big yellow spark, surely dangerous in that room filled with dry cotton napkins, flared in the, in the gloom. Come forward, Ben, Dennis said, receding his poor excuse for a dagger in its sheath. He got to his feet, trembling with gladness and relief. Ben was here. By what magic, Dennis did not know, only that it had somehow happened. His feet caught in the napkins and he stumbled forward, and there was no danger that he might fall because Ben's arms swept him up in a strong embrace. Ben was here, and all would be well, Dennis thought and it, it was all he could do to keep from bursting into unmanly tears. Chapter 107 There followed a great exchange of stories. I think you may have heard most of them, and the parts you haven't can be told quickly enough. Frisky's leap was a bullseye. She carried it straight into the pipe and then turned around to see if Naomi and Ben would follow her. If they hadn't done so, Frisky would have eventually leaped back to the ice. She would have been greatly disappointed to do it, but she would not have left her mistress for the most exciting scent in the world. Frisky knew that. Naomi was less sure. She didn't even dare call Frisky back for fear of a guard's overhearing. She therefore intended to go after the dog. She would not leave Frisky, and if Ben tried to make her, she would deck him with a right hook. She, had, she needn't have worried. The minute he spotted the pipe, Ben understood where Dennis had gone. 
Noble nose frisky, he said again. He turned to Naomi. Can you make it? If I draw back and run, I can make it. Don't misjudge where the ice goes, rotten, or you'll take a donk you'll take a dunking, and your heavy clothes will drag you down very quickly. I won't misjudge. Let me go first, Ben said. If I have to, maybe I can catch you. He drew back a few paces and jumped so strongly that he almost took off the top of his head on the upper curve of the pipe. Frisky barked once, excitedly. Shut up, dog, Ben said. Naomi drew back to the edge of the moat, stood there for a moment, the snow had by then been coming down so heavily that Ben couldn't see her, and then ran forward. Ben held his breath, hoping she wouldn't misjudge the edge of the good ice. If she ran too far before trying to make her leap, the longest arm in the world, the longest arms in the world wouldn't catch her. Remember, this is the sewer pipe. But she timed it perfectly. So we're in a flashback right now. If you've lost track, if you're from uh, you know the previous video, there's a flashback to uh, what how they got in there. She timed it perfectly. Ben didn't need to catch her. All he had to do was to get out of her way as she carried into the pipe. She didn't even bump her head as Ben had done. The worst part was the smell, Naomi said as they told their story to a wondering Dennis. How did you stand it? Well, I just kept reminding myself of what would happen to me if I got caught, Dennis said. Every time I did that, the air seemed to smell a little better. Ben laughed at this and nodded, and Dennis looked at him with shining eyes for a moment. Then he looked back at Naomi. It did smell awfully bad, though, he agreed. I remember that it smelled bad when I was a kid, but not that bad. Maybe a kid doesn't really know how bad a smell is or something. I guess that could be, Naomi said. Frisky was lying on a pile of royal napkins with her muzzle on her paws, her eyes moving from one person to the next as each spoke. She knew very little of what they were saying, but if she had, and if she could have spoken, she would have told Dennis that, her, that his perceptions of what made a really bad smell hadn't changed at all since he was a boy. It had been the last dying remainder of the dragon sand they had smelled, of course. The odor had been much stronger to Frisky than the girl and the tall boy. Dennis's scent had still been there, now mostly in splashes and blobs on the curved walls. These were places Dennis had touched with his hand. The floor of the pipes were covered with foul, warm water that washed away all scent. It was the same bright electric blue. The other scent was a dull, leathery green. Frisky was afraid of it. She knew that some scents could kill. And she knew that, not so long ago, this had been just such a scent. But it was losing its potency now, and in any case, Dennis's scent led away from the greater concentrations of it. Not too long before they reached the grating Dennis had used to get out of the sewer system, she began to lose the green smell altogether, and Frisky was never in her whole life so happy to lose a smell. "'You met no one? No one at all?' Dennis asked anxiously. "'No one,' Ben said. I ranged a little bit ahead to keep an eye out. I saw guards several times, but we always had plenty of time to get some cover before they could see us. In truth, I think we could have come directly here and passed twenty guards and only have challenged, been challenged once or twice. Most of them were drunk. Naomi nodded. Guards of the watch, she said. Drunk. And not drunk on picket along the northern borders of some pissy little barony. No one ever heard of. Drunk in the castle. Right in the castle. Dennis remembering the toneless, nose-blowing singer, if you remember that scene with that guard from previous chapters, nodded gloomily. I suppose we should be glad. If the guard of the watch was now what it was in Roland's day, we'd all be in the needle along with Peter. But I can't be glad somehow. I'll tell you this, Ben said in a soft voice. If I were Thomas, I'd, wake in my, I'd quake in my boots every time I looked north. If such as we saw tonight was all he had around him. Naomi looked very troubled at this. Pray the gods it never comes to that, she said. Ben nodded. Dennis reached out and stroked Frisky's head. Followed me all the way from Painas, did you? What a smart dog you are, aye. 
Frisky thumped her tail happily. Naomi said, I would hear the story of the sleepwalking king, Dennis, if you would tell it again. So Dennis told his story, much as he told it to Pena, and as I have told it to you. And they listened, as spellbound as children, hearing the tale of a talking wolf in the gammer's nightcap. Much like, hopefully, you are listening. And I'm not going to leave you there. We'll keep going. We're on to chapter 108. Let's roll. By the time he had finished, it was seven o'clock. Outside, a dim gray glow had come over Delane. That clotted stormlight was as bright at seven. That, cl- that clotted stormlight hmm, was as bright at seven as it would be at noon, for the greatest storm of that winter, and perhaps the greatest in history, had come to Delane. The wind howled around the eaves of the castle like a tribe of banshees. Even down here, the fugitives could hear it. Frisky raised her head and whined uneasily. What do we do now? Dennis asked. Ben, who had gone over Peter's brief note again and again, said, Until tonight... Nothing. The castle's awake by now. There's no way we could get out of here without being seen under any circumstances. We sleep, get our strength back. And tonight, before midnight, Ben spoke briefly. Naomi grinned. Dennis's eyes grew bright with excitement. Yes, said Dennis. By the gods, you're a genius, Ben. Please, I wouldn't go for that. I wouldn't go that far. No, sorry, Naomi said this. Of course. Oh, please, I wouldn't go that far, Naomi said. But by then, her grin was so broad, it seemed in danger of splitting her head in two. It's not like the most pleasant scene, the idea of somebody grinning so much it looks like their head would split in two. It's an expression. She reached over, put her arms around Ben, and kissed him soundly. Ben turned an absolutely alarming shade of red. He looked as if he might be on the verge of bursting his brains, as they said in Delane in those long-ago days. I must tell you, though, that he also looked delighted. Will Frisky help us? Ben asked when he got his breath back again. At the sound of her name, Frisky looked up again. Of course she will, but we'll need... They discussed this new plan for some time longer, and then Ben's lower face seemed almost to disappear in a great yawn. Naomi also looked tired out. They had been awake for over 24 hours by then, you will remember, and had come a great distance. They were jumping through the snow and everything like that, and leaping through pipes we just uh, heard retelling and everything. Enough, Ben said. It's time for sleep. Hooray, Naomi said, beginning to arrange more napkins and a mattress for herself beside Frisky. My legs feel as if... Dennis cleared his throat politely. What is it? Ben asked. Dennis looked at their packs. Ben's big one. Naomi's slightly smaller one. I don't suppose you've got, um, anything to eat in there, do you? Impatiently, Naomi said, of course we do. What do you think? And then she remembered that Dennis had left Pena's farmhouse six days ago and that the butler had been skulking and hiding ever since. He had a pallid, undernourished look, and his face was too narrow and too bony. Oh, Dennis, I'm sorry. We're idiots. When did you last eat? Dennis thought about this. I can't remember exactly, he said, but the last sit-down meal I had was my lunch about a week ago. Why didn't you say so first thing, you dolt? Ben exclaimed. I guess because I was so excited to see you, Dennis said and grinned, as he watched the two of them open their packs and begin rooting through the remainder of their supplies. His stomach gurgled noisily. Saliva squirted into his mouth. Have you ever had that where you know something really tasty or whatever's coming, you can feel your mouth like get filled with saliva? Then a thought struck him. You didn't bring any turnips, did you? Naomi turned and looked at him, puzzled. Turnips? I don't have any. Do you, Ben? No. A gentle and supremely happy smile spread across Dennis's face. Good, he said. Chapter 109 
That was a mighty storm indeed, and it's still told of in Delane today. Five feet of new snow had fallen. I, mean, I just love how, again, Stephen King puts all of these narrative things that just kind of makes the narrator help you believe as much as you can in a land of dragons and stuff that this, this place really exists. Even though, again, for the younger folks listening, none of this really happened and this place doesn't exist. I just have to say that for the kids, right? So five feet of new snow had fallen by the time an early howling dark came down on the castle keep. Five feet of new snow in one day is mighty enough, but the wind made drifts that were much, much bigger. By the time dark fell, the wind was no longer blowing a force gale. It was blowing a hurricane. In places along the castle walls, snow was piled 25 feet deep. You understand? 25 feet deep. That's taller than like five, pe- five, <laughs> almost five people stacked on top of each other. Um, you would be completely buried uh, or, or a house or anything like that under that. I mean, houses for medieval times type thing. 25 feet deep and covered the windows of not just the first and second floors, but the third floor windows as well. You might think this would have been good for Peter's escape plans. And it might have been, and it might have been if the needle hadn't stood all alone in the plaza. But it did, and here the wind blew the hardest. A strong man couldn't have stood against that wind. He would have been sent rolling, head over heels, until he crashed against the first stone wall on the far side of the plaza. And the wind had another effect as well. It was like a giant broom. And as fast as the snow fell, the wind blew it out of the plaza. By dark, there were huge drifts piled up against the castle and clogging most of the alleys on the west side of the castle keep. But the plaza itself was clean as a whistle. There were only the frozen cobbles waiting to break Peter's bones if his rope should break. And I must tell you by now, that Peter's rope was bound to break. When he tested it, remember he hung it from that rafter? It had held his weight. But there was one fact about that mystic thing called breaking strain that Peter didn't know. Yosef, that's the the groom, the horse uh, master who taught Peter about uh, breaking strain back in the day, Yosef hadn't known about this factor either. The ox drivers knew it. Though, and if Peter had asked them, they would have told him an old axiom, one known to sailors, loggers, seamstresses, and anyone else who works with thread or rope. The longer the cord, the sooner the break. Peter's short test rope had held him. The rope to which he must entrust his life, the very thin rope, was about 265 feet long. It was bound to break, I tell you, and the cobbles below waited to catch him and break his bones and bleed away his life. Dark, scary, what's happening here? Let's let's move on to the next chapter and maybe we'll, we'll stop there. Okay, chapter 110. Not good, right? When I heard that news, you're like, oh, he's really working on that rope for a long time. That's not going to work out? Rats. Let's hope something else can be figured out. 110. There were many disasters and near disasters on that long, stormy day, just as there were many acts of heroism, some successful and some doomed to failure. Some farmhouses in the inner baronies blew over, as the houses of the indolent pigs were blown over by the hungry wolf's breath in the old story. <sighs> well, huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Some of those who were thus rendered homeless managed to work their way across the white wastes to the castle keep, roped together for safety. You know, blowing storm, you're in this white, it's all white out. You can't see anything. So if they're going to go to the castle, you got to, and you're going with a group, you better be roped together or you, you take a few steps back or you get stuck in a snow drift or whatever. You're, you're lost. Won't be able to find you because the wind's blowing so hard too. So they can't, your voice won't carry on the wind as well. Others wandered off the Delane Great Road and into the whiteness. This is always what Stephen King's saying, where they were lost. Their frozen 
wolf gnawed bodies wouldn't be found until the spring. <sighs> Sorry, kids. But by seven that evening, the snow had finally begun to abate a little, and the wind to fall. The excitement was ending, and the castle went to bed early. There was little else to do. Fires were banked, children tucked in, last cups of field tea drunk, prayers said. One by one, the lights went out. The crier called in his loudest voice, but the wind still tore his voice out of his mouth at eight of the clock and again at nine. It was not until ten that he could be heard again, and by then, most people were asleep. Thomas was also asleep, but his sleep was not easy. There was no Dennis to stay with him and comfort him this, this night. Dennis was still home ill. That's what Thomas thinks. Thomas had thought several times of sending a page to check on him, or even to go himself. He liked Dennis very much. But something always seemed to come up. Papers to sign, petitions to hear, and of course, bottles of wine to be drunk. Thomas hoped Flag would come and give him a powder to cheer him up or to help him sleep. But ever since Flagg's useless trip into the north, the magician had been strange and distant. It was as if Flagg knew there was something wrong, but he could not tell what it was. Thomas hoped the magician would come, but hadn't dared to summon him. As always, the shrieking wind reminded Thomas of the night his father died, and he feared he would have a hard time getting to sleep and that, once he was asleep, horrible nightmares might come, dreams in which his father would scream and rant and finally burst into flames. So Thomas did what he had grown accustomed to doing. He spent the day with a glass of wine always in his hand. And if I told you how many bottles of wine this mere boy consumed before he finally went to bed at 10 o'clock, you probably wouldn't believe me. So I won't say, but it was a lot. Lying there, miserably on his sofa, wishing that Dennis was in his accustomed place on the hearth, but we know Dennis loves sleeping on the fireplace, <laughs> the king. King, give him, a, give him a couch, Thomas, for crying out loud if he's such a good friend. Uh, Thomas thought, my head aches and my stomach feels sick. Is being king worth all this? I wonder... You might wonder, too. But before Thomas himself could wonder any more, he fell heavily asleep. He slept for almost an hour, and then he rose and walked out. Out the door he went, and down the halls, ghostly in his long white nightshirt. This night, a late-going maid with an armload of sheets saw him, and he looked so much like old King Roland that the maid dropped her sheets and fled, screaming. Thomas's darkly dreaming mind heard her screams and thought they were his father's. He walked on, turning in, into the less used corridor. He pushed halfway down and pushed the secret stone. Oh, he paused halfway down and pushed the secret stone. He went into the passageway, closed the door behind him, and walked to the end of the corridor. He pushed past the panels which were behind Niner's glass eyes, and though he was still asleep, he pushed his face up to the holes, as if looking into his dead father's sitting room. And here we will leave the unfortunate boy for a while, with the smell of wine surrounding him, and the tears of regret running from his sleeping eyes down his cheeks. He was sometimes a cruel boy, often a sad boy, this pretend king. And he had almost always been a weak boy. But even now I must tell you that I do not believe he was ever really a bad boy. If you hate him because of the things he did and the things he allowed to be done, I will understand. But if you do not pity him a little bit as well, I'll be surprised. Because, you know, you judge somebody, you're judging yourself. Think about it. 
I don't know. That's not a great chapter to end on. Let's go on for one more. Chapter 111, shall we? At quarter past 11, on that momentous night, the storm breathed its last gasp. A tremendous gust of wind swept down on the cap the castle. It ran in excess of a hundred miles an hour. It tore the thinning clouds overhead apart like the swipe of a great hand. Cold, watery moonlight shone through. In the third eastern alley was a squat stone tower called the Church of the Great Gods. It had stood there since time out of mind. Many people worshipped there, but it was empty now. A good thing, too. The tower was not very tall, nowhere near the height of the needle, but it, was ne but it nevertheless stood high above the neighboring buildings in the Third Eastern Alley, and all day long it had been punished by the unbroken force of the storm wind. This final gust was just too much for it. The top 30 feet, all stone, simply blew off, as a hat might fly off a scarecrow in a high gale. Part landed in the alley. Part hit the neighboring buildings. There was a tremendous crash. <laughs> Most of the populace of the castle was asleep, wearied by the excitement of the storm and already sleeping deeply, and they took no mind of the fall of the Church of the Great Gods, although they would wonder greatly over the snow-covered wreckage in the morning. Most simply muttered and turned over and went back to sleep. Some guards of the watch, those not too drunk to care, heard it, of course, and ran to see what had happened. Other than by these few, the fall of the tower went almost completely unremarked uh, when it happened. But there were a few others who heard it, and by now, you know them all. Ben, Dennis, and Naomi, who were getting ready for their attempt to rescue the rightful king, heard it in the napkin storeroom and looked around at each other with wide eyes. Never mind, Ben said after a moment. I don't know what it was, but it doesn't matter. Let's get on with it. Besson and the lesser warders, all of them drunk, didn't hear the Church of the Great Gods fall down, but Peter did. He was sitting on the floor of his bedroom carefully pulling his woven rope through his fingers, looking anxiously for weak points. Can you imagine him? He just knows I'm going to make my escape any moment. And this teeny tiny thread, he's just doing a final check to see if there's anything he can spot. Wow. Intense. He raised his head as the snow muted thunder of falling stones was heard and went rapidly to the window. He could see nothing. Whatever had fallen on the needle's far side. Whatever had fallen was on the needle's far side. After several considering moments, he went back to his rope. Midnight was close now, and he had come to much the same conclusion as his friend Ben. It didn't matter. The dice had been thrown. Now he must go on. Deep in the darkness of the secret passage, Thomas heard the muffled thunder thud of the falling tower, and woke up. He heard the muffled barking of dogs roar, 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 below him and realized in horror where he was. Remember, he was sleepwalking, so he doesn't really know he makes these visits uh, in his sleep. So he's like, oh my God, I just I walked here in my sleep. And one other who had been sleeping lightly and dreaming troubled dreams awoke at the fall of the tower. He woke even though he was deep in the bowels of the castle. Disaster! One of the parrot's two heads screamed. Fire! Flood! And escape! The other screamed. Flag had awakened. I have told you that evil is sometimes strangely blind. And so it is. Sometimes evil is lulled with no reason and sleeps. But now flag had awakened now that's the one to leave you on all right thanks for hanging with me appreciate everybody's patience and the encouragement as we go if you're not a subscriber yet why don't you subscribe i'm, I'm putting out all sorts of cool stuff i got books on books uh we're going to be doing here putting them up on the internet for for posterity for my kids and to share it with the world at large um 
Hope to see you on the next one. We'll keep them coming every week.